Hey everybody, P.D.A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. Today's episode's got a very good friend of mine on it. His name is George Whitney. He is a nationally renowned emergency manager. And George and I go back to the 80s. We've been friends forever. We talk all the time. His brother and I are super dear friends as well. So someone very close to me. But what's really important about George, and by the way, hey everybody in Benicia, here's, here's George, hometown kid done well. Uh, George is an expert in emergency management and the processes that we go through in a situation like today when we're in this COVID-19 lockdown and trying to figure out how to survive and provisioning resources and trying to manage these crises, whether they're medical, earthquakes, hurricanes, whatever it is. It's folks like George that put together the resources to limit the amount of impact that these catastrophes have, these emergencies have. So I thought it would be really great to have George explain to us how the system works, what we can expect, what normal looks like, and just basically give us some clear guidance. So John and I sat down with George and had this great conversation just like two days ago. I turned the show around real fast so we could all have this knowledge in our heads. We've got a couple other emergency-based shows coming up as well, just because we're trying to stay on theme with this. Next, I want you guys to all take care of each other, try to stay healthy, do all the wash your hands things, all those things. Look out for one another. That's always the main thing. Hey, if you like what we do, five shows a week, all kinds of different topics, this is how you help us. Wherever you listen, register, subscribe, comment, rate, review, wherever it is, and tell some friends about it. That's what you do. If you want to buy something, you can go on the website, you can buy shirts. You know, either way, always fun to see shirts. If you, take, if you buy a shirt, take a picture of it. But that's how you support us. Sharing the show, talking about the show, letting people know about it so they can discover it. That would really be awesome. Okay, next thing is, and you know what I'm going to say now, Save the Brave, savethebrave.org. We have a powerful charity charter around here between John Scott and I, and we're always working on trying to help others out. Save the Brave is our main effort. Uh, John Scott and I all contribute our time and our money each month to the cause. Join us. Save the Brave, savethebrave.org. Do what you know how to do. Now here comes my good friend, my very good friend, George Whitney. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is George Whitney, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. Yes, indeed. George Whitney is uh, our friend and our expert on emergency services. And given the circumstances this very special week while we're all uh, sequestered for the uh, COVID-19 virus, we thought we'd ask George some questions and get his advice on how we ought to behave and what we have to look forward to in the coming weeks. So that's the whole idea, right, is to give everybody a little bit of uh, expertise. You know, there's a lot of coverage on the here and the now and a lot of repetition. So what can we do here at the Break It Down show to provide some information and some insight and or just have a professional conversation that isn't geared towards any political ends or anything like that? And, and George and I go back to the mid 80s. So I've known him for a long time. He actually... If, uh, if memory serves, you were the host on episode 50 and with John and I as, as guests of the Break It Down show. That was your one and only significant hosting experience. And now you're a full-fledged guest and it's awesome to have you around. It's gl- I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the chance to ch- chat about it. It's, it's, a, it's an important topic right now. To say the least. So I guess I'll, I'll throw a question at you. Um, you know, emergency managers can be a little preachy. You guys can focus on the fear side of things, um, but it doesn't seem that there's a lot of I told you so's going on right now. We, we seem to be in the middle of it. You are not actively a, an emergency manager, but what are you sensing from all of this? Well, there's a lot of catch up being played right now. Uh, you know, we've had, gosh, uh, to roll back the history of this, you, you know, we've been doing uh, pan flu planning for a while. There's a, you know, I think it was first suggested back in, uh, early 2000s, but there was a national planning scenario number three that was uh, s- developed really to suggest a need for a national pan flu plan. And in 2005, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, CDC folks and those close around them um, put together a national pandemic flu plan, and it was last updated in 2017. So there's been there's been some thinking around this, uh, but I can tell you, you know, uh, going back, I. 
as when I was a government emergency manager, I spent a lot of time talking about it back then. Uh, I went and looked at it again recently, and I can tell you the assumptions are way, way, way low. Uh, you know, uh, this morning, uh, Governor Cuomo in New York said that uh, his best experts are suggesting somewhere between a, a 40% and 80% infection rate. And the worst case, the worst, worst case scenario contemplated in the national pan flu plan was 30%. So there's, there's a lot of folks that are uh, playing catch up and, you know, and, you know, call it what you want, but, you know, we, in emergency management, we take a look at what works, what doesn't work. And we focus on the things that don't work. And that's kind of where my head is at right now. And there's, there's, um, we're learning a lot from this, like the lack of triggers, you know, when are we going to uh, pull the trigger on isolation and quarantine? Uh, I think the plan relied a lot on uh, our history of innovation and ability to put together a vaccination, a uh, vaccine real quick. And, you know, I think the, you know, if we get one in under a year, it's going to be amazing. Uh, but we, we, we put a lot of assumptions in there that I think are, um, we're overly optimistic. I think. You mentioned Governor Cuomo's number, uh, and I live in California, as a lot of people know. We saw Gavin Newsom do the same thing and talked about a number between 30 and 70 percent, which in effect means we have no fucking clue. You know, like we just that that that's like you can't take half of the numbers between one and 100 and say it could be them because we, we, we don't know anything at this point. W what do you is an emergency manager able to grab the boss and say, hey, man, don't put that number out there. That's not helping us. You know, let's let's figure some other way to say it. Or are you even do you even have time to work on messaging? And is that message a message you do want to go out? It's, it seems to be to be nonsensical because it just we don't know enough. Just say, hey, we don't know enough. We're still sorting this out. Continue to flatten the curve, you know, or whatever. There's a lot of things at play, and I don't know that I could call the dynamic exactly as it is in each jurisdiction, because in our big scheme of things in the country, we have a, a very bottom-up um, doctrine. Uh, we say that all disasters are local, so local health departments, uh, local public health officers are in charge of every county right now. Uh, it, with regard to this incident and the state falls in to provide support and FEMA falls in uh, behind the states to provide support. So it's hard. It's really hard to call the dynamic in each of our, you know, 3000 or so counties out there. But I think what, I think what we're, what I'm seeing, what I'm recognizing from uh, having seen this happen in other places at other times is that we've got folks that know what a worst case scenario might look like. And we've got, political leaders, you know, for good reasons, everybody's trying to do their best at this time, but political leaders who are trying to put a positive spin on this thing, because the things that we, the, the thing that we worry about most in emergency management is civil unrest. Because if you have a breakdown of civil society, you know, just about everything sort of goes out the window and they're going to do everything that they can, including a blow sunshine when it's practical to do so. Uh, so we've got we've got people out here who are talking about some worst case scenarios. And if you just look at what the typical um, infection rate of a nasty flu is, you know, it's over 50%, right? I mean, one out of every two years, I'm going to get the flu probably, mm -hmm. and that's with most people. Uh, and it's, it's, un it's unlikely if a bug like coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, that is by some accounts three times or 10 times more contagious than the flu that we're going to get then less than 50% of the population is going to get infected. So we've got, we've got people who are prepared to talk about worst case scenarios, you know, prepared to talk about activating the guard and mobilizing field hospitals. And then there's, you know, there's a political uh, side of things that wants to say, Hey folks, you know, we're going to bounce back really strong from this and enjoy your two weeks at home. Well, while we're enjoying our two weeks at home, is that number, that wide spectrum that, that uh, Pete referred to, that's got some amount of sunshine baked into it, was, that, was the high point of that number based on if we had effectively no response at all and the low, res and the low end of that number based on how flat we think we can make the curve? I mean, is there any chance that there is some sort of realism in there and, and that the spectrum is truly that wide? I So, let's see, I have to just – I'm not an epidemiologist, 
uh, and, and I'm sure that there's a lot of epidemiol epidemiological math in it, but you know, 80% is probably somewhere or whatever number any governor or public health officer came up with is probably a combination of what do we see in the flu plus what extra nastiness do we see in this bug that might bring typical flu numbers up. And then, and then it's also probably influenced by some epidemiological math person, you know, doing that calculation of if she told two friends and she told two friends and she told two friends, how fast could we get to you know, 80 million or whatever. I heard that number referred to as the R letter R not um, like, like zero. So the, the R to the power of zero and that, that, that number is a calculation of how many uh, people you will infect if the hypothetical you is infected yourself. So right now the R not of the virus as we know it, COVID-19, is like 2.3 or something, which is to say that for every person who has it right now, they're going to infect 2.3 other individuals, which means that the trajectory is headed up. And that the reason that we want to shelter in place and avoid as much contact as we, as we can possibly avoid is to try and bring that number down. Uh, what do you think the curve is in terms of time if we are effective at bringing that factor down um, that, that you would imagine the earliest is that things return to some semblance of normal, George? Yeah, well, so are not, as I understand it, is more of a calculation of the, the impact of a... Uh, a pathogen, not necessarily, or, you know, virus in this case, not necessarily like how fast it's going to spread. But to answer your question directly, uh, you listen, you read the national pandemic flu plan and it tells you to expect at least two waves. Right. And we have not even, I don't think we've even um, approached the crest of the first wave. And I don't mean to be you know, you know, to make this sound dramatic, but let's just look at the numbers. Uh, we've got, you know, we had this this virus circulating in the in the United States for quite some time. We have not yet, as of today, right? Can, Pete, you can cut it out if you want. But March twenty second, uh, we haven't rolled out uh, like testing in many places. We have rationed uh, testing to the highest profile areas or the areas that we expect have been hit the hardest. And as, I, as, as I've heard, half of the testing went into New York, and that's why New York has half of the cases right now, I think, roughly in the country. Uh, I don't think we're going to find out if we get good throughput on the testing process this coming week, say by the, you know, the, the end of the month, then, then we'll have a better sense of, of that. But I think we're going to be climbing this wave for the next two weeks at least. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, – and you're talking about comparing the flu plan to the COVID plan to, as, as a proxy. Uh, so if COVID is worse in terms of being uh, catchable and uh, easier to spread and all those kind of things, that bimodal wave could be even three waves? Is that what we're thinking? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm – I had the luxury of being able to uh, assign, uh, you know, public health folks to an EOC when I worked in one uh, and be able to like consult with them to answer these questions. I'm not an expert on this stuff. I can't tell you how many waves it's going to be, but from a, you know, from a generalist perspective, having run a state operation center, I can tell you that, you know, I believe that, that with, and I've seen a lot of people talk about this without a vaccine or an effective treatment, this thing is here to stay. And I don't know if it's going to touch 80% or 60% or a hundred percent. That really, th that depends on a couple different things, how nasty it turns out to be. And we don't know exactly how nasty it is yet. Right. Because there's so little studying yeah. that we can trust on it. And two, it depends on what it is that we're going to do. You know, are we going to, are we going to like share uh, shot glasses at uh, Daytona beach during spring break? Or are we going to stay in our homes for six weeks? 
uh, what we choose to do in that case makes a huge difference on you know what Dr. Fauci is you know at the national level is telling everybody to, to do. Let's 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 attenuate. Let's push down this curve because and and really this is one thing I really wanted to get into and I think it's like maybe the most important message now is that while people are thinking you know, I've been told to go home. I've been told to close my restaurant. I've been told it'll be two weeks, you know, we're day six and day 15, or I've been told it might be until April 7th. We're not talking, those numbers that, that uh, shelter in place duration is not uh, expected to snuff this thing out. Uh, really what we're doing is we're trying to, to blunt the impact Maybe I should choose a different word in California. We're trying to push down the impact of the curve initially in wave one. But but uh, I'm fully expecting that maybe as many as 80% of the population over the next year and a half is going to contract this virus. And, and some people are going to die. And unless we get an effective treatment or cure, we're, we're, we have a new normal that we have to adjust to. And right now what's bothering me is that there's a good, and I've seen the messaging change a little bit this weekend, I think starting yesterday with governor Cuomo, but, but leaders are starting to say two weeks is not going to be it. Four weeks is not going to be it. This thing is with us until we find a treatment or a vaccination. And because of that, we're going to have to adjust to, um, a higher mortality rate because of flu and flu-like illnesses. And we're going to have to adjust our behavior because, you know, um, sloppy wet kisses uh, at the family picnic are not going to be uh, tolerated anymore. Well, or, I know or, when I'm kissing grandma, a sloppy wet kiss at the family picnic, I don't think about getting the flu, but I'm definitely going to think about that now. Um, yeah, it's not advisable. <laughs> yeah. And, and if they're handing out blunts, you're right. California is the place where a lot of hands are going to go up. Let me let me take a, a slight aside here because I think this is an important thing too, to talk about because we, in part because of how we consume news and in part because of our dramatic response to anything President Trump does, uh, we get into these cycles where everybody raises their hands and flaps them around and says, oh, my God, this with, without any kind of historical reference or understanding of how this works in other situations. We lose all grasp of reality and, and what it means to actually get an answer. So I, I want to try to work on some of these answers. You have been an emergency manager at every level that basically it matters at all. You're an absolute out and out expert in this field and someone who speaks with authority. You have called up the National Guard. Let me just say this to the audience, first of all. The legal hurdles it takes to put ammo in the hands of the National Guard, with their, when, when them, bullets, and weapons are all immediately in the same area, are enormous. So when people say, oh, my God, the National Guard is going out to patrol the streets, let's have George give us some clarity on what that actually means. And, and as an emergency manager, when you pull the National Guard button, like how, how far into the funnel of terror are we? Oh, yeah, I wouldn't worry so much about that. I mean, gosh, and I could go on an hour on this. So let me try to be succinct. Uh, first of all, don't be freaked out when the National Guard uh, gets activated because they are us. I mean, men and women that we know uh, put on uniforms when they're called to duty and they go do that. Uh, they don't always carry ammunition. Uh, I won't I won't suggest ever uh, taunting a National Guard combat arms person, uh, but you know they've been deployed to places uh, without ammunition uh, as a show of force. Um, most often when I had to, well, I can't say I had the authority, but with the governor's okay, we I activated the guard several times, and they do an amazing job doing things like uh, like helping with mobilization. Like they can move. We activated them every year for fire season because they had pilots who could fly HH-60s or basically pilots who could fly a helicopter with a hoist with night vision. And, you know, when you're fighting fire in the middle of nowhere, that that's a that's a pretty neat resource. We've activated – I remember – I want to say, I can't remember the name of the infantry division. I want to say it was the 20th infantry in mm -hmm. Los Alamitos. Yeah. We activated 
entire infantry division to fill sandbags uh, <laughs> during flooding in late, you know, 98. And, you know, to give you a little uh, sort of maybe a slightly comical uh, view into what a state emergency oper operation center looks like, the conversation was, General, I, I need all your infantry division to go fill sandbags. And he goes, well, you know, my people are all like, uh, they're dressed in, in BDUs or camouflage, and I don't want them on a levee late at night. And, you know, and I, I walked over to the DOT folks and I said, hey, I need 10,000 orange vests. He goes, you got it. So, you know, so, you know, you put together stuff like that. Uh, and that's, that's what the guard does a lot of. They handed out masks uh, during recent fires, 2017, 2018 fires in California. They fill a lot of sandbags. Uh, they, you know, they set up and run mobilization centers, a, a term that we use to basically create camps where we can move responders in and out of. They do a lot of things. And I think the most important thing to think about if you're worried about you know, not a martial law is that uh, martial law has very, very uh, few, uh, it has very little applicability, except in like very, very, very rare cases. And there's a prohibition, uh, posse comitatus, right, on using military resources to enforce laws. So I, I, whenever I see a National Guard member activated, I, I don't get concerned or, you know, I haven't to this point yet, and I don't expect to. No, that's great, man. That that's exactly what I what I was hoping that you could say for us is that you know this calm down a little bit. This is what this is why we have these guys, and yeah, what a powerful resource they are. I mean, that's they they help to make things happen. That like that capability with the helicopter, man. I'm I'm so glad you brought that up. It's it's such a great example. Yeah, they were. I mean, from a state emergency manager's perspective, they're one of the neatest tools in the toolbox. What about the folks who are out there tomorrow, let's say, uh, providing services that are, mm, I don't know if essential is the right word. For instance, uh, plumbers, electricians who are out there and providing services where specifically mm, there's some plumbing needs to be done. Maybe it's not exactly, you know, sewer waste related, but I'm trying to get to those folks who say I'm pretty essential <laughs> and, uh, and they qualify essential. Uh, I think that convenience does go a long way, but what about those folks? How far are we from ab an absolute prohibition from somebody who's not police, fire, medical safety uh, being really allowed out? Yeah, let me let me talk about I don't know I guess a, a, like three sides of a two sided coin right. There's a lot of sort of dimensions to this. Uh, one, uh, the governor and local public health officers have a tremendous amount of authority under the Constitution, right? Uh, they they can order a ton of stuff, and I can also tell you, and I don't want to encourage anybody to do anything stupid, uh, but I can also tell you that there are there are nowhere near enough resources to enforce all the orders that could come down. Right. Uh, but having said that um, right now, I'll, I'll tell you what, I went to go visit my mom. My mom's 79 years old. Uh, I I'm asymptomatic. I don't believe I've been in contact with anybody that's had coronavirus. Uh, but, but I didn't touch a door handle in her house. Right. I didn't touch a glass. I didn't touch the refrigerator handle and I've often touched the refrigerator handle when I'm down there. Right, I'm I'm being extremely careful, and if we're not following those orders, you know, I, you can soften it if you want, but uh, we're we're taking a risk with people because right now there is a there's a segment of our population that appears to be very very susceptible to this bug, and and we sh we shouldn't pass it. Yeah, man, that's that's good advice. The and and let's just say too, for those that don't know George, George is very specific and very. De uh, deliberate about how he says and does things. So if he says something is a, is a serious concern, and he also he says he hasn't been exposed, this isn't he's not being flippant by saying that. He actually is is making a very calculated way of saying that. What's something that that we can all do to help? What's how can we as citizens be? You know, just for the folks that don't have enough. I mean, you're a marshaller of resources. You know, there are so many different people leaning forward who want to lean forward. 
what do they do if they have a resource to not be in the way, but to truly provide help? There's a, there's a short list of things that I've been thinking about that I'd really like people to do. One of them is, is watch out for the vulnerable people in your circle, right? If you've got an elderly person, if you've got somebody with autoimmune disease, if you've got somebody fighting cancer, if, if you've got somebody who's immunocompromised, and it's it's interesting. It's it goes beyond immunocompromised because I heard an interesting story. How um, I think it was Dr. Fauci might have said that uh, that older people have a tremendous immune system, and it's that tremendous immune system over decades of development that kills them because it produces this inflammation that ultimately like kills the the people who die from this thing because because uh, the body's mounting a defense that's actually you know hurts the body. Um, but, but I think the first thing is, you know, watch out for your circle of friends and that might include, you know, keeping your kids at home so that they don't, they don't infect grandma and grandpa. It might be, you know, checking on the neighbors next door, whatever. The other thing is, is I think, you know, while we're at home, it's an excellent opportunity to do all those qualitative things that we say we never have time for and wish we had more time for. Well, now we've got it. And if Congress gets their act together, we might even get paid for a while a couple of weeks or, you know, 3000 bucks worth or whatever to do those qualitative things. So, you know, as safely as you can, you know, uh, you know, paint the pictures, do the crossword puzzles, whatever, uh, with the people that you love, put in that quality time that we all want to do. I think uh, another thing I want to, um, I, I want emergency managers and I, I understand the audience is much, your audience is much more broader than emergency managers. But what I'm telling my colleagues is, is this is a wake up call. We've spent the last 20 years uh, basically, you know, creating some order to uh, an ecology of response. You know, you know, I I don't want to like get too deep into military uh, analogies or whatever, but essentially we've focused more on the structure of the way we respond than on what we do to respond. I, I want emergency managers. I'm telling emergency managers that I talk to when we get out of this, let's think about the things that could hurt us, how bad they could hurt us and what we're going to do about it. Because when it comes right down to it, we should be able to say, because it's happened in 1918 in the 1960s in you know in 2005 and 2009 and now it's happening now uh, we know that pandemic influenza is going to happen we should know when we're going to close schools we should know what we're going to say to people we should we should know uh, you know the plan forward for 18 months and right now i think it's pretty clear that we don't and i think the the last thing on my short list of things to think about and this is more just a recommendation to whoever's listening who has influence with leaders is that not only do are we sending the wrong message and i've talked about the right message you know the right message being please bear with us this is going to be a long duration incident until we can find a vaccine or a treatment uh, you know please help us blunt or excuse me attenuate this initial wave and subsequent waves, right? Uh, That's the message that should be happening. But the messengers, I think, are wrong right now. We've got political leaders, and I think they're, you know, they're seeing themselves as wartime presidents and wartime governors. Uh, But they are, I think, I know, but I can't point to a study because there's never been a study like published on it. But I know that they are the wrong messengers. The people that the country needs to hear from right now, right now are the doctors, the epidemiologists, the uh, the experts in this. And sure, you know, the president and the governors can weigh in on policy decisions that they make. But in terms of the current status of the virus and the impact and the prognosis and, you know, what can be done to attenuate the curve that needs to come from public health officials uh, and and you know and every day that we don't listen to those people first we're you know we're kind of getting robbed of a great opportunity to maximize response and just to give you a, a quick little anecdote on this um i was so 
I grew up in California emergency management, kind of rolled into the state emergency operations center at a time in the 90s when there was a lot of stuff going on. I mean, we called it the Disneyland of disaster, right? Because there was just so many things happening. Uh, and uh, and we had a, a director that had been through a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, he went on to become a consultant and he went over to Turkey and uh, and helped Turkey respond to major earthquakes after they had him in the, I want to say it was the early 2000s, whatever that big, uh, I can't remember the name of that city, whatever, uh, where that earthquake happened. But he said that, you know, there was an 85 year old seismologist or whatever that, uh, that was like the sex symbol in Turkey because he was able to come out and say, this is what we have. It's not pretty. It's, it might get a little bit worse. We might have aftershocks, but, but we're going to get better. And, uh, and he, he, he convinced me at that point, something that I, I think I already knew a little bit about, or I'd seen a couple of times that the experts need to come out and talk about the things that they are experts in. We need to see less politicians out there right now. Was that the goal cook? I, I don't know how to say the name of the town, but I remember when that happened uh, because I was, is that what it was? That one? I want to say Ismut. It, I think it was like uh, started with an I, I thought. Oh, okay. Okay. It could have been. Well, I think that's great advice, George. And I appreciate the precision of your language and the pragmatism of your tone. And uh, I just want to ask, in in this situation where we're all kind of hunkering down and we're going to take the time to be with our family, what is a good amount of preparedness in terms of food? In other words, if I have to, at some point in the next several days, make a grocery run, what should I prepare for? And if I see pandemonium at the grocery store, which I don't think we're there yet, although we have seen some shelves clear, um, you know, we, we want to be as prepared as possible without panicking, but what kind of time do you think we should be buying? Well, it's gotten close to pandemonium. I, I mean, uh, it's a good thing that I, I buy like the big uh, container of toilet paper when I, when I go to Costco, but uh, um, yeah. So, so the, the message that we've been sharing for the past 10, 15 years has been anywhere from three to seven days worth of supplies. I don't think that I don't see anything now that would change my behavior in that regard. I'm a camper and uh, you know, not as opposed to like a, you know, like a, a sensationalized prepper on TV. So I've got a lot of different supplies that I keep around for camping. And so that gives me the buffer. I think campers out there sort of have uh, an advantage, but I think, I think a seven days worth of supplies is plenty, but I think that, you know, with everything, we have to look at like the weakest link, right? If people, if there's a member of your family who has a food allergy, you know, you got to focus on having plenty of that, whatever they can eat. If there's a, a member of your family that has uh, a, a medical condition and needs prescription drugs, you know, I'd, I'd make sure that they have a 30 day supply of those drugs because you don't know what the supply chain might look like for that. But I see no indications uh, at this point, and nor do I expect them that, uh, you know, chicken nuggets or corn dogs are going to be in short supply. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Chicken nuggets or corn dogs are going to be in short supply. Well, thank God for that. (laughs) Because <laughs> I need chicken nuggets and corn dogs. Let's oh talk God. a little bit about how resources move because we, again, we get a little bit nutty and uh, don't have the experience to understand how these things are provisioned. But um, like one of our friends, Mike LaPerry, works in the restaurant wholesale business where he sells foods to restaurants. Um, he's, a forca- he's a forecaster and now he's got to adapt. Uh, our grocery stores, right? You know, if you push 40% more people through a grocery store, the shelves are going to empty out. It doesn't mean that they're out of things, but they also don't, they're not in the business of keeping 
you know, supply on hand to go waste, to go to waste. So, you know, the, the Albertsons and the Safeways and Kroger's and Publix of the world, they're, they're hiring truck drivers. They're doing things to move supplies around. What are some of the other systems that are out there, George, that are impacted by this in a way where we get, need to give them some time to, to catch up and to ramp up c- capacity? Oh, I mean, they're, they're all over there. And we're, I mean, we're going to see more. I, I mean, I can tell you, I went today to PetSmart to pick up a small bag of dog food that I would normally buy because because my Prime delivery, my Amazon Prime, no no slam on Amazon, love them, uh, but my you know my Prime delivery of Amazon dog food is taking a week, right? And and I suspect, I've heard, I suspect that they're prioritizing other shipments, and that's fine. Uh, but you know, but dog, uh, dog food, uh, is, is, uh, not a priority item apparently at this point. Um, I went today, I, I did some tiling this weekend. I'm kind of remodeling my bathroom and uh, my hand, I, I was like, I don't have any more latex gloves. I'm you know, going to go to the store. Um, the store that I go to, to buy latex gloves had a beautiful sign. I should have taken a picture of it. It said, uh, sorry for our lack of stock in latex gloves. We've donated all of them to local hospitals. Uh, so, you know, I think hospital supply chains are really, really, really strained right now. And if you think, I, I don't know what your sort of um, interest is in doing math at this point, but when you think about, let's see, 330 million people in this country, let's see if I can do this on the fly, uh, 60 million people or 60% getting infected, that's 200 million people. And they say that 20% of them are going to, if, if we get a 60% infection rate among 330 million people, 20% of them are going to require hospitalization. Is my math right? When I say 40 million. Yeah. Just say tens of millions. Yeah. Tens of millions. Thank you. uh, Might need hospitalization. And how many times do you need to change your gloves, your mask, your gown, treating one patient? That's the number. That's the number of, uh, PPE, right? Uh, personal mm-hmm. protective equipment that we need to be thinking about pushing to the the medical community. So I think there's also going to be some some interesting uh, sort of. I'll tell you, it's fascinating. I've been spending a little bit of my downtime sort of thinking about the stock market and the economy and um, uh, sort of um, indirect adverse impacts of all this stuff. And the first thing that that struck me, we call it interdependencies in emergency management, but there is a whole lot of leverage and dependencies in businesses right now. So, you know, I think uh, people who are watching the markets have understood that the Fed, the Federal Reserve has been pumping a lot of liquidity into the markets because basically, and I'm not an economist or or whatever, so don't take me uh, as a perfect teacher of this, but you know, when, when a lot of businesses borrow money and those businesses are in trouble and they, or, or they have credit lines and, and those businesses get in trouble and they start reaching for credit, credit uh, money dries up. And so the Fed's pumping in a lot of credit. And so you're seeing um, now the Fed try to avoid problems where, say, a restaurant or a major grocery store or a major refinery or a major producer of surgical masks doesn't have the operating capital that it needs to, you know, buy materials, pay staff, whatever. And, um, and we could see a bunch of uh, sort of tangential effects as a result of the credit business. So I think, I think mostly right now, I, I'm not worried about food because I think there's plenty of demand on food. I think there's a demand shock like too much demand on medical supplies and we're going to spend some time. Hopefully we're going to implement this. um, uh, I I, gosh, the, the word escapes me, Pete, Um, where we uh, want defense mobilization act, right? Where we say, Hey, uh, Ford, can you make masks instead of Mustangs? Right. You know, I hope we, I hope we get to that because I think, I think we could use that right now, but, but as this thing drags on, and who knows if it's going to take two weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever. But, you know, the, I think the first thing that, that I think about longer, a little longer term is, 
you know, we've got, I think it's 60, 65% of our economy is based on small business, right? And we've shut down a lot of those folks. And when, you know, when restaurants lose waitresses and bartenders and, you know, hair salons lose stylists and all these, and these people go do other things that offer job opportunities, we lose, not, we, we not only lose capacity, but we lose momentum when we try to restart. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes absolute sense. Yeah, for sure. It's hard to imagine what a restart is going to look and feel like because having been, you know, having been dormant for any length of time, the longer, um, you know, the longer that that time frame is, the uh, harder it is to climb out of the hole. So I think as we prepare for these things, if I'm interpreting your uh, your comments correctly, it's uh, right now time to remain calm. Uh, sort of reprioritize, focus on the folks who need the most help, and uh, ride it out as calmly as possible. But as we do that, uh, just keep an eye on what it means to ride it out. You know, uh, there's other people, you know, probably Pete uh, is one of those people who can speak to the the uh, negative utility of panic. But, you know, I would not prescribe panic in, in you know, I'd encourage the opposite of that. And, and I think it's human nature. I, I have unfortunately been in uh, aircraft that have had in-flight emergencies. And I, I was surprised the first time and, and a, you know, the same, but to a lesser extent, because I'd seen it before the second time uh, that people don't really panic. Like we see them panic in movies or we see them panic in our, you know, bad imaginations. Um, panic's really not a helpful thing. It's a, it's again, I'm not a doctor, but it's, you know, it's a physiological response that we have that drives us to think about things. And that's exactly what we should be doing. We should be thinking like I, I'm a, I run a small business. I'm thinking, you know, my customers are completely busy right now and I'm going to support them as best I can but I'm also going to be thinking about what are they going to need on the other side of this thing? If I was a truck driver, if I was a hairdresser, if I was, you know, who's somebody else that's really impacted right now, you know, somebody that's, that's, uh, I, I don't I'm trying to be funny and I can't, I can't be, it just doesn't work. Um, you, you know, if, if, you know, you should be thinking about, uh, the things I mentioned earlier, you know, thinking about the things that are important in your life, and delivering uh, adequate attention to those things. And then thinking about, I think the opportunities on the other side of this thing, because we're going to come out of it, you know, who knows when, who knows, you know, to what extent of loss, but we're going to come out. And, you know, when we come out of this, I don't want to be, I don't want to be sleeping. One of the things, since you talked about panic and all of these kind of things, um, one of the things that I know in general, I'm talking in general terms here, that uh, folks like me who've been to really shitty places and seen what hard does look like, you know, we respond a little more muted, blunted, if you will. Uh, we don't go crazy. We don't get into that panic, even if it's a social panic, that kind of thing, because we do recognize how great this country is and how fortunate we are. You can still, at this moment of the day, just about anywhere in this nation, get tacos at any time. That That is such a rare thing. And I'm not trying to make light of it, but I'm just trying to say something as trivial as getting a taco can be had everywhere. Um, the other day you were talking in one of your, uh, emergency management rooms about bananas and why there was a run on those and bananas are what they call a normalcy factor. And if bananas are not present in the marketplace, it lets us know like a it's sort of an indicator of, of what normal looks like. And so we might be out of bananas for a day or two because it is not a normal time, but we all could relax a little more. There is plenty. We don't have to hoard. We don't have to worry about what's coming next. We do have to hunker down. You know, we do have to take care of one another. But but our, our need to do something, our need to, to be informed and, and to get ahead is uh, is is probably not the best reaction. How do you, how do you, you know, take care of your household? How do you maybe plant some vegetables because this is going to be a long-term thing and get some crops coming in? How do you, you know, whatever it is that you're going to do that, um, this is a time where fight, flight, 
or freeze. This is the time where freeze, slow down, analyze what your response is going to be and, and enjoy that freezing time. Like you're talking about where will we all get to, to slow down a little bit because this, uh, this need to respond, 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 learn, act, react, you know, like it's, it's uh, it causes chaos and doesn't produce the kind of results that we want. This isn't to undermine the importance and the, and the severity of this whole thing, but um, you know we have to look at this in a in a large term and just slowly doing what you need to do is going to be a more reliable way to get to where you need to than than responding to every single thing that comes up. You know, Pete, if I can interject, right now we're hoarding toilet paper. <laughs> which means that we are creating that response that you speak of for convenience. Cause guess what? The place where I poop, has got a shower right next to it. Uh huh. But do I really need toilet paper in large quantities that bad? And the answer is no, we can all take it easy a little bit. I mean, if we are getting to the point where we're starving, then the conditions change, you know, that's a different conversation, but right now the indications you know, that come from what it is we see people hoarding are strictly out of convenience. That, and I think there's people chasing other people's bad interpretation of what's going on too. We, we have to really be careful of that. Uh, You know, um, I don't, I've never ever contemplated a need for having a hundred rolls of toilet paper. I I mean, I, I, I I can't even imagine the shame I'd feel if I was like having to push that through a, you know, a, a checkers line, but, but there's, but we do that. I mean, there's people, there's people a month ago who were like clamoring to buy. I, I told you that I'm, I'm spending a little time looking at the stock market uh, for indicators, right? There, there were a month ago, there were people clamoring to buy Tesla stock over $900 a share, right? When, when like the, the most uh, enthusiastic finan- uh, like uh, stock analyst was saying it's worth 350. Well, you know, this week it was 350. Uh, just because a uh, hundred people go and fight for toilet paper is not is doesn't inspire me to go fight for toilet paper. Yeah, <laughs> not inspired to fight for toilet paper. Hey, let's talk a little bit more about the leadership around here because we also get distracted by this. And, and, and what is some reality? You know, you've worked with the senior people in, you know, a, a, a city, a county. You know, you've, you've partnered with folks that who work with the president or the head of FEMA or whoever it is. You know this, this whole response reaction. What is it like to be, uh, you know, any of the governors right now, Gov- Governor Newsom's in California, so we use this as an example. What is his day to day like? He looks like hell, sounds like hell. I know he's working his heart out, but what is it like to be those guys in in his immediate circle as they're all doing things? You know, every leader is different. Uh, um, I, I mean, I can tell you they have a ton of things that they they have to be involved in, and I've been involved with leaders who have you know, maybe five minutes to give to a big issue. And then they're rolling off to another issue, you know, and, and there's been times where I'd, be, where I'd think like, I don't know, I don't want to be too specific, but there'd be times where I'd be, where I'd be wanting to talk with a political leader, at, like at a state level about an impending electrical crisis. Right. Uh, and, you know, and they'd be like, and their chief of staff would tell me, uh, you're not reading the talking points. Uh, this month is all about education. We're talking, we're not talking about emergencies, right? So you end up kind of going, Hey, wait a second. We don't get to script this stuff or schedule it. Sometimes we just have to sort of have to deal with it. And sometimes all you get is five, 10 minutes. Uh, I think, you know, I'm, I'm heartened that I, I really appreciate. And I posted something about this on Facebook this week that the president said, you know, the vice president is going to lead this task force and the vice president has all this leeway to bring all the experts together and to nail this thing. And those folks, uh, you know, as apolitically as I can say it, they have been all over this thing, uh, looking at issues, talking to different people, letting them know what's going on. Um, you know, and, and I think you can, I think, uh, <laughs> even a reasonably savvy person can see and again, I want to stay political here, but you know, the president, when he's coming out, he's sort of, you know, he's the color commentator uh, and also the chief executive for these briefings. 
but the people that are standing behind him have done, they're plugged in. They're doing a ton of work. They've, they've, uh, they've looked at this thing a bunch of different ways. Okay. So when we're talking about these leaders then and, and our response to their reaction, are we being unfair if we're overly celebratory or overly critical of them? If we're looking at their policy from eight months ago and, you know, look, <laughs> All we have to do to find out how hard this is, is if, if we don't think President Trump is doing a good job, you can look at how President Obama responded to the H1N1 swine flu thing. You know, like these things aren't easy problems to nail down. We're trying to marshal resources at the national level. You know, your, your tens of millions that are going to get sick, they are not evenly proportioned across the nation in a grid that makes any damn sense, you know, like, uh, okay, let's say we have enough respirators. I defy anybody to get enough air pumps into the right hospitals in advance of, of the problem. Uh, talk a little bit about what's, what, what should we actually expect from these folks as they try to sort these problems out? And, and would you want to trade place, George, if I can make you George governor of Utah, would you want that job right now this moment? No, I've never wanted a political appointment. I love emergency management because it's solving problems that, you know, that confound a lot of people or, you know, or doing our best. And when I say solving, sometimes 70% solution is, you know, every time 70% is better than 30% solution, right? So I I love the profession. It is it, it is young people's work because it's, it's real, I mean, the hours you work, the permutations of you know what can happen are endless that you sort of run through um but but uh, to answer your question directly i would not want to be a governor right now but you know this is an emergency manager's time to shine and the the st to give you sort of a glimpse of what they're what they should be doing and i i'm you know those of you who know me know that i'm i'm a uh, I'm complimentary and critical of my, of my profession of sort of in, in equal measure, you know, according to the time or when it's deserved or, you know, needed. Um, we've got, we've got a great uh, passion inside our profession of emergency managers. We, there are people who will stay up and sacrifice a lot uh, to get this stuff done, but we're also suffer from, I think what a lot of emergency, what a lot of first responders sort of suffer from. And it's sort of attention deficit. We sort of run to the fire and not necessarily think about the things that we're taking to the fire sort of thing. Right now, what emergency managers are doing, uh, you know, with varying degrees of preparation are what, you know, Pete and John, what our friends are doing in the area of the state of California where we grew up in, right? They own restaurants, they own um, contracting firms, they own supply distribution companies, whatever. And they were told that as of last Friday, they can't work. And they're thinking through sort of the best possible actions that they're going to take. That's what a lot of these folks are doing. Uh, when it comes right down to it, the math that I shared with you earlier is the math that they, they should all be doing right now. My county has X number of people uh, I can expect on a worst case scenario that X number of people will be infected. I can expect that X number of people infected will require X number of beds. And I need to get on the phone with the hospitals and make sure that those hospitals are supported. And if they don't have support or adequate support, and very few of them will, I'm going to get on the phone to the state and I'm going to punch them to get on the phone with the feds. And I'm going to try to get those resources. And that'll take care of my number one priority, which will be you know, getting acute medical conditions hospitalized effectively. Then I'm going to be thinking about, you know, making sure that we have you know, like support for general society, you know, and I think we've, we've adapted pretty well to that. We've told uh, restaurateurs, don't, sh don't shut your doors. Don't lay off your people, go to takeout if you can. Right. And in California, how awesome we can now uh, take out or order cocktails for takeout, right? So there's been those adaptations to try to keep the fabric of society or the you know ecology of business or whatever you want to call it sort of in place. And then you take a look at the other things that can add value. You know, um, I've seen stores. Thankfully, th stores are saying, you know, we understand that elderly and immunocompromised people are are at risk. We're going to give them dedicated time in a grocery store. 
I, I think I've seen that now across the country taking place. Uh, we take a look at mobilizing people to provide support. Uh, organizations like the Salvation Army and others are saying, we're here, we'll provide this support. There's community groups, there's neighborhood groups, there's all these sort of other groups that can stand up and do sort of things. There's a lot of different things that we can do. Yeah, man, there are a lot of things we can do. Give us something that we don't know. I mean, obviously you've given us a lot of things already, but what's something that we don't know about how these things shake out? Uh, I mean, in the EOC, is it still bonkers, crazy, frantic energy? This is such an unusual crisis. I was trying to think it through the other day. Like this is like a, you know, a Loma Prieta earthquake, but across the entire nation, but not everywhere has the problem and it's coming, but maybe it's not. And, you know, there's not planes flying in the sky, like normal, kind of like nine 11, but it, but it's like none of those things. Cause you can look around and you're like, everybody's fine. Everybody's fine. You know, and it, it's really tough to sit there and say, uh, you know, as, as a daycare provider and you're waiting for kids to come in the door but there are no kids coming because they're not, you, you can't, you can't have them there. It's such a weird thing to wrap your hands around. Yeah. This might be the most critical thing that I have to say, uh, you know, during this interview is, is um, but, but I'm going to turn it into a positive. Uh, we've, we've got, you know, in everyday life and in emergency management, we've got a merging, a confluence of cultures that go on. And Pete, you know, you've written and worked extensively on this thing. Uh, there is a, there's a huge, I can't overstate this. There's a huge difference in emergency manager, first responder and public health organization cultures to the extent that if you go to the U S department of Homeland Security's website right now, and you find, and you ask, you know, whatever, speak into your Siri or Google it. Uh, you ask, you know, what are the measures of emergency preparedness or Homeland Security preparedness in the U S DHS will tell you there's 32 core capabilities, right? If you go over and one of them, I should say one of them is public health ESF eight. If you go over to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, and ask the same sort of question, they won't say refer to the Department of Homeland Security and see ESF uh, 8 or you know public health. They'll say, no, we've developed our own 15 core capabilities, right? Uh, we've got we've got an interagency, which is what the federal government likes to call a family of agencies that don't have the same definition of this response, uh, this, you know, the structure to support it, whatever we need to spend some time rethinking or I'd say asserting more effort toward things that we know already to be true, that, that, uh, the best organizations are organizations that can blend cultures and capabilities. And, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I've worked a fair amount of my career in the private sector and uh, the private sector gets it, right? If you go, some of the largest contracts that I've won as a project manager or as a you know member of a project team are projects that I'm able to bring different companies together with different capabilities, cultures, whatever, to solve a problem. And uh, that's what we need to do now. And that might be, aside from the biology of this virus, that might be the second uh, biggest hurdle that we have is overcoming what we sometimes refer to as stovepipes. We need to, we need to maybe not blend cultures, maybe not obliterate cultures, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. We need to appreciate that, that there's a lot of different perspectives. And when we're able to listen, incorporate factor and apply something with multiple, with, with all those perspectives, we're better. Yeah, man, I, I agree. A anything in closing, John? Well, I never thought that I would hear fighting for toilet paper articulated in a sentence. So that was kind of a highlight. Uh, I also took from this that the fabric of society is dependent somehow on booze in a to-go cup, which I'm also hopeful about. And then an earthquake in, in Turkey made a seismologist in his 80s a sex symbol. I think it's time that emergency managers are recognized for the sexiness of their job and that uh, hopefully the blowhards on, uh, on the political ends of the spectrum 
uh, will calm down a little bit, let the experts be the experts, and that uh, cooler heads will prevail. So um, I just want to say, George, I appreciate uh, your good advice. I appreciate the precision of your language that you always bring, that you just took the time to uh, kind of help us take a look at a perspective that, that says, um, let's let cooler heads prevail. Well, thanks, guys, and thank you for what you do. 